Um, I just realized I'm supposed to be giving announcements and I don't have my page. So we'll have to do announcements <laughs> later. Um, I was thinking on the way to church, which actually is a very short drive for me, but I was thinking about the word distraction. And I was thinking about, you know, how they add the word or the dis in front of the word and traction. So if something's distracting you, it's um, keeping you from gaining traction in the direction that you should be going. So I want you to think about that this morning. I want you to set aside your distractions from this week because the direction you should be going in this morning is to worship the king, to praise his name, to be reminded that he is the way maker. He is the peace bringer. He is the, the one who can change any situation uh, from what it is to what it should be to align with his word. So set aside your distractions this morning. Go ahead. Give it a little shake. Raise your hands with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we worship you. We came here this morning to praise your name. We came here this morning to be reminded of who you are. You are the way maker. You are the resurrector. You are the restorer. You are the healer. You bring prosperity, Lord God, in places that are dead. We just thank you, Father God, for your presence this morning. We're thankful, we're so grateful this morning that nothing can steal our worship. Nothing can steal our praise. All we have to do is open our mouth, set aside the distractions, and look to you, Lord God. We can praise your name, we can worship your name, we can remind ourselves of who you are, and we worship you this morning. And we just thank you for freedom in this place this morning. Freedom to praise your name. Freedom to stand in your presence. Freedom to raise our hands. Freedom to move our feet, Lord God. We're just so grateful this morning for freedom in this place. Worship with me this morning. Amen. Come on, let's lift the name of Jesus together. No! 
turns these into highways. You're the only
last night and, and this morning, I've, I've just been, have a stirring in my heart and I keep hearing over and over again, all glory, all honor, all praise, all power be unto you, O Lord. And I've been saying that and I feel like God is saying, I, I want my people to declare that. Um, I want them to agree with that. I want them to say that. When we say amen, at the, it's midst, let it be so, let it be so. And so could we, could we do that? That's what we've been doing this morning, but I feel like the Lord's wanting us to make a declaration out of our mouth. All glory, all, glory. all, honor. all honor, all power, all power. Be, unto you, o Lord. be unto you, O Lord. And then this morning he gave me this scripture. Um, and I say this a lot in my, in my private time with him. And I'm not going to read all of this, but it's from the Song of Moses in De Deuteronomy 32. But it says, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord. I will ascribe greatness to my God. He is the rock, and his work is perfect. For all his ways are just, and a God of faithfulness and without injustice, or a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright are you, O Lord. And so I'm going to repeat that again, and I want you to repeat each, each verse over me. It's like the Lord wants us to come into this place that we're saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, to your plans and your purposes for this day and for this hour. We may not understand all of this, what's going to happen and take place. But, Father God, we know that you are on the throne and you are in control and that you are faithful. And we say yes. We can say yes because we can trust you because you have been faithful, because you have been so good to us. And so we say yes, not knowing what's all taking place, what knowing what's going to unfold before us, but that we have a firm foundation in you and we can stand in the midst of what's taken place because our eyes are up on you father so we say yes to your purpose and your plan for your righteousness and your justice for this time for such a time as this and so I'm going to read this and then if you repeat after me for for we for we proclaim the name of the Lord for we, we proclaim, proclaim the, name the name of the Lord we ascribe greatness to our God we ascribe greatness to our God you are the rock you are the rock. Your work is perfect. Your work is perfect. For all your ways are just. For all your ways are just. You are a God of truth. You are a God of truth. And without injustice. And without injustice. Righteous and upright are you. Righteous and upright are you. We trust you, Lord. We, we say you, yes, Lord. Lord. We say yes, Lord. Yes. Amen. On that note, <laughs> oh, praise God, praise God, praise God. Just take a minute of praise, and we're going to take communion, which is his covenant with us. He came, lived, showed us the kingdom, and died. You can be seated. And died in our stead. And he is looking for us to just give him everything. Give him your life. Give him your yes. Give him your plans. Give him your strength. Give him all of your desires and let him sanctify it. Let him cleanse you. Let him change you. Amen. I'm going to use a slightly different scripture for communion, but it's 1 Peter 2.24 very popular, well-known scripture, but it encapsulates for us what he did. It said he, I'm using the New Living, he said he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross. That we being dead to sin might live for what is right, live unto righteousness, Jesus took it all for us, took every sin. He took all of your fault, all of your fallen nature. He took all of it, nailed it to the cross, 
that you might be dead to sin. You no longer are under its bondage. You no longer have to say yes to what it declares to you when it inflames in you because the law came that we might know sin and when we knew sin, it became inflamed in our, our earthly, fleshy nature. But he gave us a nature on the inside of us through the spirit that is greater grace where sin abounds Grace does much, much more abound. Hallelujah. He gave us grace to overcome. Grace that empowers us to say no to sin and yes to righteousness, to live unto righteousness. And when we falter and when we fail, and we do, we have a God that we can go to who has not been touched with our infirmity. And he brings us back into his righteousness for his forgiveness. I was out, you know, just out for a, a walk the other day, just praying, and I started to think about how he never leaves us and never forsakes us. Sometimes some of us are thick, we're a little slow, whatever, the devil fights, we have these mindsets, all of these different things. And he never quits on us. And the, the, the scripture came up, his compassions, they fail not. If you will keep taking a step with God, if you will keep walking forward, if you will keep pressing in, his compassions, they fail not for you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He will stay where we might give up on one another. He never gives up. He keeps pressing in with you until you arrive at the place that he's predestined for you, for your life that's written in the book for you before you were even born. Hallelujah. He's such a good God. His ways are good. His truths are good. His, his, his doctrine is good. It's the way we live by the script. It's good. Hallelujah. Anyway. Ha. Huh. So that we might live right and by his, well, it says wounds, but stripes. By the stripes he bore on the back. By the beating he took before the cross. You were healed. Body, mind, soul, and born again of the spirit of the living God. So in that, on the night that he was being betrayed, on the night that he knew this was happening, he gathered his disciples together. And he, and let's take the cup. The bread first, Pete says. <laughs> bread first, let's do it in right order. <laughs> his body was about to be so disfigured you couldn't even recognize. He took that for every sickness, every disease, every infirmity, every pain and every wound that you would have to experience. He took it, he bore it that you don't have to. So take a minute, Lord, we thank you that by your stripes, we are here and we receive it and we thank Thank you for all that you suffered on our behalf. In Jesus' name, we take it. We thank you, Lord. Sickness and disease has to leave in Jesus' name. It has to go. It cannot stay has no right to you. Give it no place in you, in Jesus' name. And then he said at night, he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. Remember the covenant in his blood. You know, the word that Ina just gave, we don't know what's coming, but you, you sense in your spirit and we know prophetically, everything that can be shaken will be shaken, so that that which cannot be shaken will remain. But he put us on an unshakable 
ground, in an unshakable kingdom. He did that for us. He broke covenant with us. He said, I will be your strength. I will be your joy. I will be your all in all. I will be there for you. I will never leave you for, nor forsake you. This is a covenant that's ratified in my blood and there's not a demon in hell that can change it, stop it, or, or, or hinder it in Jesus' name. But you can. So live for God. Live out of your spirit to God. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you for the covenant in your blood. And we thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth. Jesus. Take a minute, and if the Lord brings up anything in your heart, repent. Just say, Lord, forgive me. I change, I turn from that, and I trust you. Amen. With that, thank you guys. Such a beautiful day. Amen. Thank you, uh, Allison. Thank you, Sarah and praise team. You're already seated, so I don't have to say that part. Um, you know, I was, um, Allison asked me last night, uh, so what are you going to preach on? And I had been spending the entire day. I started Friday night and worked in late into the night and then got up early and Saturday morning and uh, prepared myself, studied. Um, and uh, she came back later in the day and she said, so what are you going to preach on? I said, I have no idea. I really don't. And so sometimes the Lord will do that to me. One time, he didn't tell me until I got all the way up here. I spent the day preparing. I really didn't know what I was. I really asked him. I did. It wasn't like I was sitting out there. Um, but what he told me that time, he said, you prepare. And when you get up there, you're going to flow. I said, OK. And I had to believe God for that. Because it's a little unnerving sometimes to walk in the spirit. Because you don't always know. What's going to happen? You have to trust God. You have to trust God. And so he's, he's taught me over the years. Um, are we going to have the children go downstairs? All right, well, children, you got that for free. So now you can go downstairs <laughs> and uh, have children's church. When I was, when I was thinking about, um, I was in high school, and I'd become a Christian when I was about 16 years old. Wait till there's a look. Well, I, this is kind of the fun part to you guys. Um, and I really had, I gave my heart over to the Lord. I mean, I was, I just dove in head first, feet first. Um, and I would, there were times, sometimes when the teachers weren't there, I just would start talking to everybody and all the, all the, Seats in the classroom would just come in a big circle around, and I would just talk about God. Um, this, I was 16 years old. I really didn't know what I was too much of what I was talking about, but the little that I knew about Jesus, I was going to tell. And um, I had a certain courage, and um, but I was still afraid. I wasn't. I wasn't a good speaker. I wasn't a natural speaker. Um, I was a studier. I was a thinker, but I wasn't a real good speaker. So. Um, Anyway, I wanted to go to Bible school as a, as a kid. I wanted to, after I got out of high school, I wanted to go to Rhema Bible School. And so I thought for sure that's where God wanted me to go. So I was just kind of just thinking about it, and I was praying about it. And the Lord said, I don't want you to go there. I want, I want to teach you by my spirit. I want you to go become an engineer. And I was shocked. I literally was shocked. I was like, well... Well, um, <laughs> that's not my answer that I was expecting. I was really expecting him to say, yep, go in there, and you're going to learn, and you're going to da-da-da, and you're going to be uh, a minister or whatever. And uh, he didn't say that. He said he wanted me to go. So I went uh, to Michigan Tech. I studied to become an engineer. Um, I came back here and began to work for LECO, and I've been here ever since. Um, 
But one, one time, it, it, it sort of puzzled me. And then I, at one time, I was, I was sitting in a movie theater, and the Lord just explained to me this, this weekend what, what, why the movie was the way it was. Um, the movie was, remember that movie? I don't remember the name of it, but it was that football uh, story about the, the man who got into the tryouts, but he was just playing like street football with his friends. Anybody remember seeing that? Like nobody. I was thinking at least Wynn would help me out here. But anyway, um, he, he, wasn't, he didn't come up through college and get through the draft and, and get picked. He, he, he was playing football. He loved football. He was playing it on the streets with, with his friends. They played hard football without pads. These guys were hardcore. And, uh, but he, he had gotten good. He had he developed uh, skill. And uh, he, they had one day, they decided to open up a uh, training day and, and tryout day for anybody who wanted to come. And he, through this circumstance, he decided to go and he got in. Just a, uh, an amazing story, an amazing fluke, probably a one-of-a-kind kind of a story. But in the middle of that movie, the whole screen went dark. Jesus appeared. All I saw was a silhouette of him, like his head and, and his, his shoulders. It was like... Yet silhouette, best way I can say. And he said, will you speak for me? And it was just that quick. And I said, I will. And just that quick, back comes the movie, and I'm back in. But I can't think of anything except what he just said. And it wasn't as if, you know, when the Lord asks you something, it wasn't really a question. It was more like, you'll speak for me. Right? That kind of a thing. Right? Um, he, he really wasn't looking for a no. He was, he was giving me an assignment. And so um, I said yes to him. The good thing about when you say yes to the Lord about something, when you make a quality decision for the Lord, that settles it. So the next time things come along, like Pastor asked me to, to preach when he was gone this, this week, and I'm really, really, really busy at work. We've got, I've got 12 projects. Three of them are like wars. Each one of those wars has at least three or four battles. I have plenty to do. I have plenty to keep myself occupied. But I had told the Lord I would speak for him. And that settled it with me. And so when I'm asked to speak, unless it's something that I really feel a check or, or if I'm going to be out of town or something like that, I just say yes. And I don't even give my flesh a chance to say no. I don't give myself a chance to object I don't give myself a chance to get afraid and get worried and get wondering, what am I going to speak about? I just say yes, and I trust God that if I put in my effort, he's going to come and he's going to help me. He, he's going to anoint the service. Amen? So I just thought I'd say that to encourage some of you. Um, and then yesterday, so I spent all day in the scriptures and in prayer and walking around praying in the spirit. Um, and... I still didn't know exactly what I was going to say. Then he said he wanted me to read the book of Exodus until he says stop. Well, that's got 40 chapters in it. And it was, it was about 8 o'clock at night, and I was getting worried that I'd have time to even. I'm not a fast reader. I'm a thinker. I, I read a little bit, and I think. I read a little bit, and I think. So um, I said, okay. I heard just as clear as day. He, and I read all the way through Exodus chapter 20, and then he said, that's enough. I said, Whoo. <laughs> that took a while to get that far. And I didn't know why he wanted me to, to read it, but now I do. He, he highlighted to me when he asked Moses to speak for him. Remember when there was the burning bush and Moses saw it and it was burning, but the bush wasn't consumed. And he said, I've got to go aside and see what this is. And as he came closer, he realized it was God. And God said, take off your shoes. He was, he was on holy ground. And, and the Lord asked him to speak for him. And uh, he, he objected. He's like, I get tongue-tied. I get up there. I get, I get tongue-tied. I'm not a good speaker. I, I, I babble. I stutter. I stammer. I don't, I, I'm not good at that. And it made the Lord angry at first. You remember that? He said, didn't I create the mouth? Don't I form the words? Didn't I make you? Don't I know that already? 
I didn't ask you if you stammer. I said, asked you to speak for me. You know, it would have been, I don't know what, if, if he had said yes to that, I believe maybe there was another reward for him. If he had said yes, he said no, God made another way. Sometimes that happens in our lives. But there may have been another reward. But God could have straightened out his tongue when he went before Pharaoh. Or he could have gone up there and said, let my, let, let, let my people, people, people go, go, go. And they laughed at him until he threw his rod down and it turned into a serpent. They threw theirs down and his ate theirs. Now, who's laughing now? So he'll take your weakness. It, it's something you may not be confident in, something you may not be good at, you may not think you're good at. But he'll take it if you'll let him, and he'll anoint it, and he'll turn it into something good. And he'll defeat the enemy with your weakness. The weakness of God is greater than the strength of man. Your own weakness that you have in your, in your frame and how you were made wasn't, was designed to carry God in strength and in power. But it doesn't look that way at first. It doesn't look that way when we look at it from the first time. So anyway, um, there's that. I still don't know. I finally at about, was it this morning or last night? When you asked me, and I finally knew what I was talking about. I think it was this morning. Yeah, it was about 8.30. And, and she said, do you know what? She, first she thought I was kidding. She's like, you, you, you just don't want to tell me. I said, no, I really don't know. And, and I said, why would I lie the day before I'm supposed to preach? I get, get up there. And I'm in trouble. And, uh, but uh, at 8.30 this morning, at 8.30 last night, for the first time, I felt the anointing. Now, we, always, we have the anointing abiding in us. We have the Holy Spirit abiding in us, but sometimes we don't feel it. We don't experience it. We don't, we're not, but we, we go by faith, and we step out in faith without necessarily always feeling anointed. We have to trust that anointing is abiding in us, that that spring is abiding in us, and when we open our mouth, that a river is going to come out if we've been asked to talk, a river of living water, because Jesus said it. You know, I've, his, his words and the words of Scripture have become so precious to me. They, they weren't always that way. I, I learned from them, but, they, but certain, certain words of his have become so precious because I believe them. And I experienced them in my life. I've seen the fruit of it. And it's more than just words. These are a promise of his that I know that I can activate my faith. And I can receive that promise. I can walk in that promise. I can walk in the spirit. So, um, but he, he leads us along a path. And here already, I, I was going to start one way. And here I am just going right in the middle of it. Um, but we're, we're going to read... Um, I want to read Ephesians chapter 1, the prayer at the end, for, uh, starts in verse 15. And if you can put that up in the New King James, I have to click my thing here. for a second. I'll tell you this story. I can feel myself shaking just a little bit. I don't know if you can see that. So I'm still not calm. I remember um, one time, and I think I've told some of you this story, but I was reading my Bible at home, sitting there with Allison. We had a, a lady come live with us who was being abused by her husband. And uh, I was reading the scripture, and, and it said, if the good man had the house, had known the day and the hour that thief would come, he would not have let his house be broken through. And I closed the door, I said, closed the book, I said, I wonder what that is. Boom, boom, boom on the, back, on the front door. And this guy, this lady's husband was at the front door about to break it down. I said, well, that's, that, I guess that's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. So I went out there, and uh, inside I was shaking like a leaf. This guy's bigger than me, he's meaner than me, probably a bit drunk. 
drunk is okay, because then I can move a little faster and get. <laughs> but he's mean, you know, hits you in the mouth, and you gotta, then Allison's in there, and I can't let him in, and so all these thoughts are going through my head, right? Just these natural thoughts, because here's a natural man standing, wanting to break my door down. I open up the door, and uh, I said, what do you want? What are you pounding on the door for? It's my wife in there. I want my wife. I said, well, she's not coming out when you're in this kind of an attitude. I, I, that wasn't me. <laughs> I, so I'm kind of bracing myself. And he said, you can't stop me. You close the door. I'm going to bust the door down. I'm coming in anyway. You know, I said, I said, God's a whole lot bigger than you and me put together. What you're going to do is get back and get in your car and sit there until I come out and get you. Okay. He, he turned around, went back to his car and sat down. I was shaking like a leaf. But the Holy Spirit gave me the words. And that day, and that hour, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to answer him. I like to wrestle, but I don't like to hit and face. I didn't want to fight him. She wasn't even at her house. She was out working somewhere. And he didn't want her to work. Now I got a cover for that, too. Yeah, anyway. So let's read the, let's read the scriptures. I'm going to get us back on, back on track here. But I want, I want you to know his, his scriptures are true. They're real. His word is good. When he says something, he means it. When you read something in the scripture, it isn't just so you feel better. You know, there's a scripture that says that every thought of his, I'm in every thought of yours. Every thought that you have, I'm in your thoughts. Now, you could say, well, that's just, that's nice. No, Jesus, the Father, is always thinking about you. There's never a moment, there's never a moment in time when he's not thinking of you. And he doesn't think of us the way we think. He thinks deeply. He thinks good thoughts. He thinks purpose. He thinks love. He thinks what, what he's designed for your life. Every moment he's thinking of you, every single moment. You say, well, how is that possible? There's billions of people on the earth. God is infinite. He's infinitely layered. He can take a, 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 his Holy Spirit, he can put it in you and 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 put, put it in a billion people, and it's not hard for him. He's God. So he can think about each one of us individually, deeply, and not be schizophrenic. You know, sometimes we, we, have, we can only do uh, one thing at a time sometimes. But that really isn't true. You know, I told you at, at work I've got all these projects going on, and they were all like hitting at once. And it reminded me of somebody had said, the measure of, of, of the strength of a nation is how many fronts you can fight on at once. And, you know, in World War II, they were fighting on this front and that front and this front and that front and this front. And uh, so the Lord said to me, go into the multiplicity of your soul. I said, okay. I didn't know exactly what that meant. <laughs> but if you let go, then all these, all these fragments, they kind of work their way out, and you can deal with them. What, as you need to deal with them. The Holy Spirit knows how to orchestrate that. He knows how to do it. He knows your capacity. Just expand your capacity. I went from being overwhelmed to settling about 12 things in about five minutes looking for more. I really was. I was like, well, now I'm a little bored. I went from overwhelmed <laughs> to looking for more to do. That's what God can do. We have a capacity that's made in his image. We're made like him. And so, but sometimes we need, God needs to expand our capacity because our mind is all shrunken down and we think we can only handle a certain amount. And that's because we're walking as mere men. We're not walking in the spirit. In the spirit, everything's possible. You can feed 5,000 with one fish in a loaf, right? There's nothing impossible. So so allow God to expand your spirit, expand your mind, expand your heart. You know, some, some one person was called to, he, he, he knew he was called to, uh, 
to do something for God, but he didn't know what. And with through the, the situations he came, he ended up putting in uh, um, wells in multiple regions, setting up schools, doing all kinds. He didn't. He he was nobody. He didn't know anything other than he trusted God, and God made a way f- for him to fulfill his life. And as Ellison said, every one of us, before we were born, before we were even formed in the womb, God wrote a whole book about us. Before he, even one, one of our cells was duplicated, replicated, he wrote all of our members, what, what we were going to be like, what we enjoyed, what, our, what we were going to do in life, each one of our days before we lived one of them. Every thought, before we even think a thought, it says, he, he already knows it. Before we form a word in our mouth, he already knows it. He's God. And so as we learn to walk in the Spirit and trust in that, that he's gone ahead of us. He, he's gone ahead in our future to prepare our way for the things that he's already written about us. Every one of us has, has things written about us that we're to do, and we can walk into the fulfillment of that book. We don't have to, as Allison said, it's ours to choose. We can can be afraid, we can stay in our flesh, we can walk away, we can say we can give up, we can say it's too hard, or we can say yes. We can say yes, we can cry, because it feels hard, but the choice is ours. So let's get back to the scriptures. Um, in, in Ephesians, I imagine you have it. Do you have it up there? Oh, don't worry about it. I got it here. Is it up there? Okay. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Father, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation now to be released in the lives of your believers as we re- reach out by faith to receive revelation, to receive wisdom. Father, I thank you that it is ours, that it is part of our inheritance. I pray, Father, that the eyes of our, our understanding will be enlightened, that we will know the hope of our calling, that we will know the riches of the glory of our inheritance in the saints. And what is your exceeding greatness of of your power towards us who believe? Amen. Now we're going to go to uh, Ephesians 3. There's another prayer. I like to read, I like to pray these myself a lot. Um, I I often, on Tuesday nights, it's what I lead with because I I desire to have a revelation. I I desire to have something to, to offer. And I know... My own brain doesn't have anything. I don't have anything worthwhile to say. I can teach you some equations and heat transfer or whatever. Who cares about that? Um, But I know God does have something to say. And so I always ask him for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And then um, in Ephesians chapter 3... I'm going to start in uh, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And Father, I thank you now for filling us with all the fullness of God. I thank you, Father, that you would strengthen us in our inner man, the inner man of the heart, the one that was created, was given to us as a gift when we were born again. I pray, Father, that that inner man would would be strengthened today by the words that are spoken. I pray, Father, that, that we will experience victory over our flesh and victory over our enemies because of your great grace and your great promises in Jesus' name.
Amen. Hallelujah. You know, one word from God. One word. I was listening yesterday. I was, um, you know, I was studying, and Allison was listening to this guy. I forget what his name was. I'd never heard him before. And she said, that was really good. That was really good. That guy was solid. He was good. That was just really good. And I just, it just caught my attention. I said, well, do you mind if I listen to him? And I, this, as God is my witness, his first word out of his mouth, something left inside me. I said, whoo, hallelujah. I felt a word from God. Just one, I felt the anointing. Now, I've been waiting. I've been asking God. I know what it's like to walk in the anointing. When you walk in the anointing, nothing matters. It really doesn't. You don't have a care in the world. The peace of God that passes understanding is keeping your heart, keeping your mind. You can face death. You can face your enemies. You can face whatever. When you are walking in that awareness of his anointing, you're like Superman. You're like the Incredible Hulk. And I know what that's like. You know, Moses, he's, it says of him that he chose... God, he chose the sufferings of Christ. The suffering, the Christ is the word anointing. He, he chose the sufferings and the persecution that comes with anointing, with the anointing of God on his life, with following God, that presence of God when he spoke to him face to face in, in the burning bush. He chose that anointing over the treasures of Egypt in Pharaoh, over everything that he could have had. He, he chose the suffering, the persecution. When you taste of the Lord, how good he is, when you taste that anointing, when you taste his presence, that's enough. That's enough to carry you. It's enough to bring you the next step forward in your path. And I'd rather have his anointing. I told him this morning, I don't want to go up there by myself. Oh, Brother Peter, with boring as, as can be, I don't want to go up there without you. I, but I want to go up with you. I'll go up anyway. I'll go up because I said I would. But I don't want to go without you. Um, so now we're going to get to this, the sermon on the mount. <laughs> this always happens. Uh, so... The way I was going to title this is, and they will all be taught by God. And this is a controversial thing sometimes, um, but so I want to give you plenty of scriptures so you can see for yourself, Jesus said it, um, Paul said it, Ezekiel said it, Jeremiah said it, Isaiah said it, they all said it. Um, but let's start out in John chapter 6, verse 45. It takes a little bit to navigate back there. So, are we there? Man, he's faster than I am. John uh, 6. Okay. Now, this is an interesting thing. This is another thing I wanted to say. That we have a body. We live in a body. We have a soul. And, but we are a spirit. And when we're born again, God said back in, in uh, Ezekiel, which we're going to read, he said, I'm going to put a new heart in you, and I'm going to put a new, a new spirit in you. And Jesus said, don't you know you have to be born again in order to see the kingdom? So when, when we say yes to God, when we repent of our sins and we receive him as our Lord, he puts a new spirit inside of us. That spirit is, is made in his image, in his likeness. It's seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Um, but it's, it's not mature. It's not strong. It's, it's young and a babe. And so he says, desire the pure milk of the word. Remember, Paul says that, that you may be strengthened. You may learn the ways of God. And it's because our, our spirit, although it knows all things, it doesn't know how yet to uh, command, and we don't know how to let it command and rule in our lives. We're so used to our minds working. 
And that's our soul, our minds, our feelings. And I heard this one person say, or Allison say, somebody, um, well, I don't feel, I don't feel healed. What feelings got to do with it? Really? Well, what, what does that got to do? That's the soul. That got nothing to do with you being healed. If you receive by faith that by his stripes I was healed, he himself bore my infirmities and carried my sicknesses and my diseases on the cross, and by his stripes I am healed. That's it. That's it. That's enough. And, but it's got to it's get in our hearts. As Allison had said on Tuesday, the, these, the words, have, we have to believe them. It isn't enough that we just say them. We have to really believe them. And that comes by drinking, by eating, by meditating, by doing the words of God, by stepping out in faith when you don't feel confident, but you know you're supposed to. You know, and the reason why sometimes we, we don't do what we're supposed to do is because we live in a fallen world, and there's persecution. Those that live godly will be persecuted. So you open your mouth, like, like ah, you know, I just don't want to do it because I know if I open up my mouth, that's, then, then I'm just going to do this, this whole warfare thing, and the flesh is going to, people's flesh are going to erupt, and I'm going to have to walk through that whole thing. So you ask God for wisdom, and he's, he may tell you anyway, Open your mouth and say it anyway. It can be, the, the Christian life can be the hardest life to live on the planet. I think it is. There's nothing really harder. It's not easy to walk upright before God because you're going to face the contradiction of sinners. You will. You're going to faith, face persecution. You're going to face misunderstandings. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. They hid, her, they hid their faces from him. When he was carrying all that for us, we didn't know it. They thought he was stricken, smitten of God. They didn't know he was doing it for them. So you'll be misunderstood too. Some will love you, some will hate you. Jesus said to his disciples at the end, he said, I'm going to go away and you're going to have time of intense sorrow. Because where I go, you can't come. And he said also, the time's coming. If Know this, that if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And they're going to put you to death. Well, I'm not sure. I, I wasn't sure what I signed up for. And so now I'm afraid. I'm sad. And he's going. I'm afraid for my life. I don't know. What to do? Peter, you know, he summoned up his own human courage, and he said, I'll never leave you. I won't. All these guys may, losers, but not me. And he, he remember, he took the sword, and he cut off the, that, the air. He was going to be tough until he wasn't. The reason he wasn't is because his heart hadn't been transformed yet. He still had rocks in his heart. He hadn't been given a new heart, but as soon as God did, remember on the day of Pentecost, when God filled him with the, the Spirit, he stood up with all boldness. He didn't care who, who got dragged to jail that day. He didn't care. There, there didn't mean, also, I also want to say this, later on in Peter's life, he didn't want to get persecuted again. Remember with the, uh, there was a time when he was sitting with the Jews and, um, but he wouldn't sit with the Gentiles when the Jews came. And, you know, he was, he was being hypocritical. Why? Because of persecution. Even those Jews who were Christians, if they weren't out of that thing, they were going to persecute him. This is Peter. Tongues of fire whew, on his head. So there are still things God works out of us. Every day he works things out of us. We don't really come to perfection unless you're like Enoch and God says it. You come come on with me now. You made it. Or Jesus. Um, I think there's always things in our lives. He's given us more and more land, more and more of our soul, more of our inheritance, more that we didn't understand. He's 
He's opening us. He's expanding us. He's growing us. He's taking things out of us. There, there are words that people have spoken over us that have wounded us, that have, have hurt, that, that have distorted us, and we kind of walk with a limp. And then God tells you something, and you hear it through that filter, and you're like, oh, no, well, that probably isn't for me, or God, he probably doesn't think of me like that. That's the enemy speaking to you. God loves you. But our, our minds have to be renewed. We have to dare to believe God despite what other people have told us. And that's why he said, you've got to love me with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. Because if you love someone else better than you love God, then their words are going to be more important to you than God's words. And if they've said something to take you, set you out of the way or off course, you're going to believe that. So he said, I want you to love me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Only care about what I think about you. God told me that once. I was sitting there debating, you know, well, I know so-and-so's got a problem with this. This is at work. And so-and-so, you know, if I go out upon it. And I was trying to figure out what I can say to kind of fit between all the cracks so I wouldn't get beat on. And God stopped me right in the middle. He said, I don't want you to care what people think about you. I want you to care what I think about you. Whew, that set me free. He said, I don't care what you think. I don't get God doesn't. He doesn't care what you think. He doesn't care what you think. He doesn't care what you think. He, he wants me to care what he thinks. And you can't do anything useful if, if, if you have all this other stuff going on. You're going to be preferring one or stepping on somebody. You're going to be just screwed up, looking for attention, looking for approval in men, looking for somebody to give you an attaboy, didn't I do well? Um, those, all, those are good things. When we do do well, we want to um, do those. <laughs> the scripture came to my mind in Thessalonians, he said, mind your own business. He did. He said, mind, mind your own business. You, you care about you. You let them worry about themselves. Don't you get all meddling up in people's lives. Don't get gossiping. Don't get excited to tell the story about somebody that you heard. It puts them in a bad light. Or puts them... Don't get all excited about that. Mind your own business. Yeah, Thessalonians. We can look that up. I have it down here. Um, Okay, I took that tributary, and then it kind of dead-ended. So now I come back over here. All right. Um, so did you guys get to John 6, 45 yet? Okay. He said, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. You know, the, um, in 1 John, it says, you don't need anybody to teach you. Now, pastors get a little nervous when they read, when some pastors, our pastor doesn't get nervous, but some pastors are like, well, no, you need teachers, you need, to. well, you do, but Jesus said, no man comes to, the fa to me except the Father draws him, so unless you listen to the Father and learn from him, you're never going to come to Jesus, and that's what he was talking about here in, in chapter 6 of John, he was telling them, unless you eat my body, eat my flesh, and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And they turned to one another, and they said, well, this is a hard saying. Was he, want, he, he wants us to be cannibals. We eat his. And he said, he said to them, the flesh profits nothing. It's the spirit. The words that I speak to you, they're spirit. He wasn't talking about eating his body and drinking his blood. He was talking about receiving him, receiving his life. Remember when he called, he said, whoever's thirsty, come and let him drink, and out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. He was inviting them to come and partake of the Father, to partake of his life, to partake of, um, of the Lord Jesus, to put him on, to receive him on the inside, and to go where he is and live with him, to, to you know, when, um, when God comes inside us, it's like we've 
we've, we've partaken of him. We've eaten him. We've, we've taken him in on the inside of us. And that's what, so his words were spirit, but they, people in the flesh in, interpreted them naturally. And a lot of them got up and left. They said, this is just too hard. This, I, I don't know what he's, and, and Jesus didn't go running after him. Oh, wait, no, no, what, what I really meant was, wait, wait, come back. Now, isn't that strange? There's nothing seeker friendly about Jesus. He says, is that hard for you? How about this one? How about you see, when I raise up and I go back to heaven, I sit at the right hand of my father. What, does that offend you? He doesn't play. He's not seeker friendly. He said, unless the Father calls you, you can't come to me. Then he turned to his disciples, the only ones left. So you're going to leave too? Yeah, he's not seeker friendly. He's pure truth. He's straight up God. He doesn't need your approval. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your opinion. He needs our obedience. He needs us to follow. He needs us to decide. Are we going to follow him? Are we going to go our own way? I, you know, that surprised me. That's why it used to scare me. I used to, when, I, when I first got born again, all I would read is the red letters because I trusted Jesus. I knew him. That's all I knew. And by gosh, but here's some scary stuff in there. <laughs> Isn't it? I didn't understand that. Like, well, okay, let's move right along to chapter 7. I didn't know what to do with that. But I said, okay, well, Jesus said it. Uh, I'm going to put that right over here somewhere, and we're going to move on to the next part. Um, and then he said, uh, do, you, do you also want to go, we'll go away? And Peter said, Lord, whom, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you would have thought, Jesus said, well, good. You guys got it. He said, didn't I choose you and one of you is a devil? Woo! That wasn't very nice. He could have encouraged Peter a little bit. Anyway, all I want to say is God doesn't always do things our way. But if we humble ourselves and we receive words of spirit, our flesh may get offended. Our flesh may get offended. But our spirit will receive it as the pure milk or meat of the word of God, and we'll ingest us, and it'll make us stronger. It'll make us stronger. It's the inner man that has to receive strength. This, this outer thing is going to perish. It's going to get a little older. I just turned 60 last August. I still can't believe that. <laughs> that just seems weird to me. I remember when my dad turned 60, and I was trying to encourage him. I said, well, you know what they say about 60, Dad? You know, you're kind of at the pinnacle of your physical and your mental and your spiritual capacity. I was just making it up. I didn't know. I was trying to make him feel better. And I'm like, look, at here I am, 60 years old. What am I saying? You know better than that. Anyway, um, I'm, not le- I'm not strong like I was. Um, but I'm getting back in shape. We're working, working it out. Um, all right. We got distracted there, didn't we? Let's, let's go to uh, 1 John, and we're not ready to close yet, but we're going to go just a little bit deeper here for a moment. This is the one where uh, every time you hear people say, well, when I've heard people talk about this, or even the commentary in the Bible, they back up, well, you know, that's not what he really meant. Um, yeah, he did. He really meant it. So 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 20, let's start there. up there yep but you have an anointing from the holy one and you all and you know all things well really yep your inner man your spirit when 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 you're when somebody preaches and the word of god comes out and you catch it it isn't the first time you heard that your spirit is bearing witness with the holy spirit that that's true There's truth in there. God gave you his spirit so you can discern this stuff. You know, he was talking about 
deceit people who are coming into church to deceive people, bringing another gospel, bringing another word. He said, you're not going to know that it's true from the inside here. It's going to sound wrong to you. Don't go that way. Don't follow it. You know the truth. It's in you. You don't need anybody to teach you. You know the truth. That would have helped me a lot of times when I was growing up. I follow people. Like, well, you know, they're saying kind of the right thing, but I get this check in my spirit. That didn't, that didn't sound right. That didn't look right. It didn't feel right. But I just, well, you know, I just do it anyway. And you can save yourself a lot of trouble. We have an anointing from the Holy One. And let's go back down to uh, verse 28. Nope, that's too far. I think it's 26. Yeah. You, oh, 20, sorry, 26. These things I have written you, here it is, um, concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing, this is 27, which you have received from him abides in you. You don't have to wait to be anointed. You are anointed. You don't have to ask to be anointed again. Now, I ask that... You know, we have the anointing on the inside, and then sometimes he, he'll come upon us also. I don't know all the ways of God. I just know that sometimes that's what happens. You can get out here preaching. You can be walking in revelation, everything, and then all of a sudden you're done, and it just stops. It's over. And you're like, uh, I guess we're all done here. That's happened to me so many times. I just walk right out until it stops, and then I stop. So... Um, there's that, but there's the anointing that is abiding in us. And that's what I'm talking about. The anointing which you have received for him abides in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, say all things. All things. I looked that up. Guess what it means? All things. All things. <laughs> and the anointing is true, and it is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Now, that's hard. You say, well, we, I guess we don't need teachers. Well, don't just stick with one scripture and make a canopy and put a big sign up and say, we don't need any teachers anymore. You got to take the full counsel of God. But he's saying here, there were times in my life when I didn't need to teach. I don't need a teacher. I know. I have his anointing abiding in me. I, there's maybe deceivers coming. There may be uh, uh, some, some situation. I don't have time to go consult teachers. I have to know, I have to live from the inside. We have to learn to walk in the spirit by ourselves. With him, walk with God in the cool of the day. Listen, wait on him. Sometimes it takes some time to settle our minds down. As Becca was talking, there's distractions of our lives. We're all in different conflicts. We're in different wars, different things that are going on. Take some time. So quiet yourself in the morning. Quiet, just, just quiet your time. Tell me times it takes some time. Um, there was an exercise I probably, I know I need to get back to, but the Lord would have me sit there until I felt his anointing. Now, sometimes that would take an hour. Sometimes it would take longer. Sometimes it would take five minutes. But I would wait, and I would learn what, it, what his anointing is like, what his voice is like, what he sounds like, what he's not. You learn the difference. The word of God is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's, it's alive. It'll cut right in there between your soul and your spirit. It'll discern the thoughts and intents of your heart. And it'll tell you the truth. But it takes us time. Why does it take so much time? Well, we live in a fallen world. You can blame Adam for that, or Eve. It was Eve's fault, I think. Um, no, Ad, it, was, it was really Adam's fault. Um, but with that, the devil came in, and he's brought sin and brought all kinds of, of wickedness and, and evil and different things. So things are slow down here. There's demonic principalities and powers that slow things down in the second heaven. Remember Daniel? He prayed and fasted 21 days, and the, the angel said, on the first day that you turned your face to the Lord to seek him. I was sent from the presence of God with a word for you, with your answer. But I was 
I was obstructed. I was resisted by the principality of Persia. And no one helped me except Michael. Michael came, took care of business, and I went on to come see you. 21 days later, things can move slow down here. Sometimes we don't get an answer right away. Doesn't mean his word isn't true. Doesn't mean heaven isn't working. Doesn't mean God hasn't heard you. Hallelujah. Now I get all excited. <laughs> I see myself like walking out, just staying, just walking on the air, just walking right out. Anyway, all right. Um, but we have that anointing abiding on the inside of us, and we need to learn what it sounds like. We need to learn the voice of our own spirit. We need to learn the voice of the Holy Spirit, how that's different from the, the, the sound of our brain, the sound of our mind, the sound of our feelings, even the sound of our heart sometimes. The heart can waver. Ooh, your mind can be, what do you call it, double-minded. You can be double-minded. Don't trust that. Trust the anointing. Trust the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Trust your spirit. Begin to learn to live by your spirit. It can be a lonely life. It can be lonely. It can feel a little boring at times because you're trying to learn. You don't know what you're doing, and you're telling, yeah, oh, oh, you know, everybody's moving around around you, and you're just trying to, oh. you know, you look stupid sometimes. But that's okay. Learn how to live by the spirit. Learn how to walk in the spirit. Um, okay. So the anointing teaches us all things. It's true, but if that's true, why do we need teachers? Well, that's where Thessalonians takes care of it, and we'll, we'll close with this. That's where he told you to mind his own, your own business. You know, just in case kids are thinking to tell their parents to mind their own business, you are their business. Yeah, until you're fully grown, until you're an adult, until you're out of the house, you're their business. Now... On the other hand, once you get married and you're out on your own, they're not your business. Whoa-oh. All right, let me say that again. For this cause shall a man leave his mom and dad, his mother and father, to cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. When that happens, they're no longer your business. They're their own, they got their own business. You mind your own business, you let them mind their business. I don't know why I'm saying all that. I mean... All right, First Thessalonians 4. And verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God. What do you say? For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. He said, I don't need to write you about this because you're already taught on the inside to have love for one another. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And indeed, you do so towards all the brethren who are in Macedonia. Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase the more and the more. That's why we need teachers. We know, we know the truth, but it hasn't really grown in us. It hasn't been necessarily activated. We, we need to be encouraged. We need to be reminded. Remember, Peter said, I, I find it necessary to remind you of the things that we've taught you. That's why teachers, and that's why God anoints teachers to bring us the truth. But he doesn't have to. When God said that he would, I wanted to go to Bible school, he said, I'll teach you by my spirit. I was really disappointed. I really wanted to go. And... But I look back on my life, and God has done exactly what he said he would do. He has taught me by his spirit. Now, he's used men and women to teach me also, but he's taught me a lot by his spirit. I know how to go get and receive revelation now. I didn't used to know how to do that. I know how to, how to walk in the spirit. I know how to get in his presence. I know what, I know what his, his voice sounds like. I know the difference between the voice of God and the voice of my own mind. He's taught me that. God has taught me all things in my spirit, and, and he can teach you the same thing. He can teach all of us. But we need one another to
to, to help one another. That's why he gave gifts in the body. That's why he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Do we all come to maturity? We're not all mature. When, when we're first young, all we can eat is milk. And that seems pretty heavy at first. And then as we mature and we, we walk in the truth that we know, that we understand that God's given us, as we walk in that, we can take heavier meat. We can take meat. We can, we can, we can take some hard sayings. We can grow up. Mind your own business. And whatnot. Okay. Here we go. But we urge you, brother, that you increase more and more and that you inspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are without, and that you may lack nothing. The anointing brings with it not only wisdom and understanding, it brings provision. Everything that he w w wrote about you in your book, he already has provided, he has provision already re ready for you. So as you begin to walk in this, angels begin to get busy. And I want to say this, too, and this, we'll close with this. When, when God sent Moses to Egypt, and he, he first appeared to Pharaoh, and he told him to let the people go, he threw down his rod, and it became a serpent. And remember what the magicians did? They threw down theirs. It became a, it became a serpent. Now, do you think that surprised God? Oh, what am I going to do now? He just ate them. His stick ate their serpents, ate their serpents, and he brought it back up again. He said, what's next? The very, the fir, very fir, fir, first plagues, the next one, he turned water into blood. They did it too. Next thing, they made frogs come out of water. They did that too. Now, God had a purpose in doing that. He could have picked the hardest thing first and, and made them fail. But he wanted to, us to know they were deceiving Signs and wonders. We got to grow up. Just because you see a little something, doesn't mean it's God. You have an anointing on the inside. Whew. You can tell the difference between the magicians and Moses. Maturity will tell you, the anointing will tell you. It finally got to a point, Moses took some dust, he threw it up in the air and became gnats. They couldn't do that. They tried to conjure that one up. They couldn't get that one done. And none of the next. But there were a lot more, and more, and another one, and another one. And he brought the locusts, remember? He, he made it dark for three days, just pitch black. They couldn't see anything. And everyone just stood still. They're afraid they're going to bump into something. They couldn't see. But in Goshen, where, where, the, where the people of Israel were, it was light, just like normal day. Day and night, day and night, day and night. Whoo, Hallelujah. But he was rescuing his people. In Deuteronomy, he says, who ever heard of this? Who ever heard that God went into a nation and pulled out another nation with signs and wonders and a mighty hand and an outstretched arm? Who heard of this before? It had never been done. God's going to rescue this nation, the United States of America. I'm looking forward to it. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's saving this nation with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm. He's going to pull the people out for his own. And he's going to give them authority over the wicked. Doesn't look like it right now. Does it? It looks like the farthest thing. Are you kidding me? Seems like it's getting worse and worse. Well, remember when, when that first miracle happened and he put the snakes, snakes down there and picked it back up? You know the very next thing that happened? They took the straw away. His, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He said, take their straw away and make the quota the same as it was. Now they got to go out and pick up straw. They couldn't take the straw. They, they wouldn't give them any straw. They got to go pick it up and find it and make the same number of bricks. And then they beat them. Beat them, beat them, beat them, beat them, beat them, because they wouldn't make their quota. And they came back to Moses and said, it's gotten harder. They're beating us now. Sometimes when you say yes to the Lord, you get a little beaten. 
Hang in there. Don't quit. It's not over. It's not over. I remember there was one. I was excited. I thought everybody would be excited that I was born again. I was telling everybody, did you know Jesus? He saves you. Come live inside you. All of a sudden, you know, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? Shut up. I don't want to talk to you. Well, they tell me about how in the garden, how come the serpent, all this religious mumbo jumbo, arguing with me about stuff. This one parents, they said, you know, you just spent too much time in the Bible. You need to get out, have a real life. I said, well, you need a life, period. I couldn't find many people to agree with me. I, it was harder to, I was harder at first. It was, I couldn't, my own mom, who's a Christian, why are you getting up, why? I'd run home from school. I was so, I was so hungry. I was so thirsty. I'd run up into my room, shut the door, and read everything red, and just read and think about it, and, read, read, read. and my, it made my mom crazy. Like, what are you doing? Go out and play. Go do some stuff. You're, you're a young man. Do it. I said, I don't want to. There's nothing else I want to do. This is all I want to do. I can't wait to come home. I can't wait to that, that school bell ring. I can jump on my bike, I ride home, and I come home, and, and I can spend time. But every day, I also knew I failed. Like, oh, God, I failed you. I, I didn't do that right. God, next tomorrow, help me to be, help me to be better. I didn't, I didn't defend you like I should. I didn't say the right thing. I didn't do the right thing. And so I just, ah, just work it out with God until I just fall asleep and come the next day and do it all over again. And I get beat at school. But that wasn't the end of it. That wasn't the end. That was a training ground. That was a training ground for my spirit, for my heart, for my life. And, uh, you know, one, and I really will close with this. As <laughs> I was talking to somebody. I've never had a mentor. I always kind of wanted a mentor. Um, so as an engineer, I never, I never had somebody who took me under their wing and taught me things and brought me up. It was always, it was usually the opposite. It, it was usually get out of my face or jealousy, or people take what you have and then kick you, and they, they got a bigger position, so they just take it. I mean, just, I, I never had somebody take care of me, to look after me. To, and so I was kind of thinking about that, feeling a little sad, and the Holy Spirit said, I've been your mentor. Whew. That settled it. I said, you, you've never, I've never been as good to anybody as you've been to me. Every time I had a question, they think I'm a genius at work because I keep getting answers. <laughs> but I cheat because I ask the Holy Spirit. You can have a real difficult problem. I mean, something that you, you, there's, you can't see an answer to it. There is no answer to it. And I just stop and I ask the Holy Spirit and boom. I say, how, they say, how does he do that? How, I don't know. He just does it. He does it. He just does it. That's the Holy Spirit teaching me. My brain isn't like that. And my brain doesn't work that quick. I sit and meditate and I think it doesn't just snap like that all the time. So learn to walk with God. Learn to love him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Surrender your life to him. Give him everything. He purchased you anyway. You're not, you're not your own. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to Jesus. He paid a, a handsome price for you, a, a, a huge price. We're not our own, so let's live like that. Amen? All right, let's all stand to our feet. I'm just going to pray. Father, I thank you for the anointing that abides in each one of us that believes. I pray, Father, for the assurance of that anointing, that it would grow greater and greater and greater, that we would know that greater is you that is in us, greater is the anointing that it's in us than he who is in the world. I thank you, Father, for that, that wisdom, the spirit of wisdom growing and increasing in us, the spirit of revelation growing and increasing in us, Father. I thank you for courage growing and increasing in us. I thank you for your word finding place in our hearts, that we would treasure your word above anyone else's words, anything else that anybody has said to us. 
that we would treasure your word and that you would remove out of our hearts any stones that are remaining, any, any lies, any, any uh, hidden sin, Father, that you would heal us, and that you would make us like you are, that we can live in this world as you lived, victoriously and full of love, full of mercy, full of compassion, full of the power of the Holy Spirit, full of the life of the Father. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Peter. I mean, in summary, being a Christian is hard, but the Holy Spirit makes you look smart. And it actually says in the Bible to mind your own business. I never knew that. But think about, there's probably a few headaches we could be saved from if we minded our own business and focused on what God has for us. Um, a few announcements before you go. Um, we appreciate your giving. We will take your cash money any way you would like to give it to us, paper or electronically. If you need help with that, please let me know. Uh, prophetic prayer meeting is on Tuesday night, 7 p.m., right here. Uh, the prophetic class will meet next Sunday on the 14th, and the deliverance class will meet the following Sunday on the 21st. Uh, the men of GCC will join the men's conference at Living Word in Muskegon on April 19th. If you need um, information on that, you can talk to Pastor Ron. And the National Day of Prayer is May 2nd at the Band Shell in St. Joe at 12 noon. And with that, you're dismissed. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>